Hello and welcome. Well, once you welcome home the arrival of your newborn, there's a process of adjusting to your new life and establishing a new sense of normal. And whilst it's expected that parents will experience exhaustion, sleep deprivation, and just general feelings of worry and concern, it's worthwhile to have an understanding of what is considered normal levels of unhappiness and what is considered a little more serious and closer to feelings of depression. So that said, we're here today to discuss a very serious topic of postnatal depression to shed some light on this very important topic. So to do so, we welcome our special guest, Heather Lindsay, a registered nurse and parenting coach who works with mothers with postnatal depression. Thanks for joining us. How are you? I'm very good, Rachel. How are you? Yeah, really excited to be speaking with you on this topic. And it is, it's a difficult subject to be able to discuss, um, but it's all with, with the view, of course, to be able to help and make a difference to anyone um, watching and listening. Um, and as we've sort of found out and uh, have, been, have been experiencing um, recently, mental health is becoming more frequent um, topic in the public. Um, however, I guess there is still a significant stigma about admitting that um, if you are a mum, that you are struggling and uh, needing to seek help. Um, so, you know, with, with mental health issues, I guess mothers aren't immune from this stigma. I'd just love to know initially, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, it, it, there is. I mean, there's a mental health um, stigma about any condition, you know, even depression and anxiety in general. It then gets that extra level when it comes to mums because there's that expectation that we place upon ourselves, that we get from family and friends and society that, you know, when we get that beautiful baby home, that it's all just love, joy, sunshine and lollipops. And for some of us, you know, one in 10 of us, it's the complete opposite. And then admitting that you're not enjoying it, you're not feeling connected and, you know, it's not the way you feel it should be, then brings all that shame that maybe you're doing something wrong, that you're a bad mum, and that if you start talking about how you're feeling, that other people are just going to judge you for it. Mm -hmm. um, and so you just end up in this cycle and it's, you know, really destructive to mothers and families and, you know, the relationship that they have with their children. So it's a really hard topic to talk about, but an essential topic to talk about as well. Couldn't agree with you anymore. Um, and in preparing for um, our chat today, I was doing some research and um, according to Panda, which is Perinatal Anxiety and Depression Australia, a, a wonderful organisation that do incredible work. Um, mm. They state that more than one, more than one in seven new mums and up to one in 10 new fathers experience postnatal depression um, and you know roughly it's about 16 percent of women after birth of their baby experience postnatal depression um, now you're personally very passionate about supporting new mums which was prompted originally by your own personal experience um, could you maybe tell us a little bit about this and um, what was it that that sort of motivated you to help other mums in this space Oh, wow. So it's quite a story. So um, I've got three kids um, and I've had postnatal depression with each of them. Wow. It was my second child, um, my second daughter, who's now six and a half, almost seven, where it was really the hardest. I actually became a single mum when I was 28 weeks pregnant with her. I split with my ex-partner. And it was actually a really traumatic separation for various reasons, apart from the fact that I was pregnant. And it really set me down into depression and anxiety. And it just spiraled so much that by the end of my pregnancy, and the pregnancy developed well and my daughter was healthy and growing inside me, but my obstetrician was really worried about my mental health. I was losing weight because I couldn't sleep. I was constantly worried and panicked. And you know, I wasn't you know, really doing a good job looking after my toddler at home as well. It was just just the most dark place that I've ever been in before and I'm then sorry. I'm just really sorry you experienced that <laughs> yeah oh, it was it was awful you know I've had a lot of time to cope with it and rationalize it and process it of what it was um, and as the years go on and heal and I've done a lot of work on myself and my experiences 
um, it is what it is. It, it was the past and it doesn't change the type of mum that I am now or the connection that I have with any of my children. And the hardest bit for me was, was that I had a very difficult birth with her. I had a um, postpartum hemorrhage and became really quite sick in hospital. But I wasn't connected with her when she was born. So with my first child, it was like, oh my God, tears of joy. And I was so happy. Um, and my postnatal depression happened later. But with my second daughter, when I held her, I felt nothing. And I whispered to my best friend at the time, who was my birth partner, and I said, I feel nothing. And I just held this baby on me and was just completely disconnected. Mm -hmm. And she was a very colicky baby and she screamed for the first nine weeks of her life. And she almost drove me insane. And I never really connected with her in those first couple of weeks. And that was really hard to go through. I was, you know, coping with it all on my own. Um, I had family and friends come and help me during the day. But every mum knows that if you don't have someone there at, you know, 10 o'clock at night or one o'clock in the morning, it falls all on you. And that's what it did to me. And there were days that I wasn't actually sure that I was going to get through it alive. And I did. Um, and I had some wonderful friends who pulled me through it. And it wasn't until she settled down that I could start to get a little bit more on a grasp of her and her needs um, and adjust to being a single mom with mm -hmm. a newborn baby and a toddler. <laughs> wow. What an experience. So how was it um, that you sort of brought yourself through, through that time? Um, and I mean, we're going to discuss a lot of things in great detail, but is there maybe just one key point that maybe you can share with us that, that sort of helped you or, and or could help anyone watching and listening in a similar scenario? The, the best gift that being a single mum has given me has made me realise that I can't do it on my own. I'm not a single mum now. I have repartnered, which is wonderful, but I spent almost seven years on my own. And if I had not actually learnt to, you know, realize that asking for help and connecting with the people around me who love me, who want to be there to support me. If I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have got through it. So I sort of had to swallow my pride a bit and, you know, trust that the people around me wouldn't judge me and, you know, call my friends at, you know, nine, 10 o'clock at night and say, I need someone to come over and hold this screaming baby for me because I'm about to lose my mind and that that was okay. And my biggest takeaway to any mum who's feeling like they're trapped or, you know, that motherhood is suffocating them is to tell someone and to just trust, you know, one or two people in your life. You don't have to get on Facebook and tell everybody how you're feeling, um, but just try and trust someone and reach out because it had made my life so much easier and I wouldn't have gotten through it without being able to reach out having a very strong sort of close support network is what sort of helps and what you suggest others to do. Is that right? It is. We're not all blessed to have huge support networks. Mm. Um, you know, I was very lucky. I had only one or two friends um, that I, you know, I knew I could count on. My parents lived quite a distance away. Um, so I couldn't call them. So for those of us who okay. don't have heaps of friends who we can contact, it's just picking one or two people or, you know, your partner or husband, if you have one and you trust them, um, is to just start small and get whatever support network you can close and then start to branch out and start to connect with your GP and, you know, organisations, like you said, Panda is uh, wonderful and the Gidget Foundation mm -hmm. and um, there are some amazing community organisations out there to support mums. Now, we published your article tidy, titled, if I can say my words, <laughs> Worried <laughs> About Being Labelled a Bad Mum for Having P&D, There's No Need. Now, for someone who hasn't yet read the article, can you please tell us what it's about and just uh, what inspired you to write it? Well, um, I've always been an open book about my postnatal depression experiences because I know that the more we talk about it, 
um, the more it normalizes it and normalizes it as something that may happen to you and that isn't actually a reflection on your ability to parent. Mm -hmm. And so my motivation towards reaching that article, uh, writing that article for you guys was not only to share part of my experiences, but also to hopefully just realize for mums that there is should be no stigma attached to um, postnatal depression. And the more articles we have, the more podcasts, the more videos, the more people we talk about it, um, the more mums we'll actually reach. And then hopefully you reach that one mum who's in that really dark spot, reading her phone in the middle of the night, crying, hating herself, feeling so guilty, and just goes, oh, it's actually not my fault and then that mum reaches out for help and that's what I really wanted to do with the article yeah <clears throat> sorry it's a bit emotional hearing all this stuff of course um now initially there's lots to discuss on this but I'd like to to just establish from the get-go you know what is postnatal depression and how can a new mum recognize the early signs well postnatal depression uh -huh. which is often also called perinatal depression so mm -hmm. it's uh, symptoms of depression and anxiety that happen either during pregnancy or up to, um, you know, during that first year of life after birth. Mm -hmm. um, and so quite often, you know, the symptoms are just like um, normal depression. Um, and I say normal in inverted commas because no one's exactly normal. So it's, you know, feeling constantly sad or crying you know, tired um, or, you know, fatigued, even if your baby is sleeping well, you know, you're losing interest in things that you perhaps, you know, were interested in before, or you don't want to connect with, you know, your friends and your family, you might be feeling a bit withdrawn. Um, you end up having all those, you know, negative thoughts in your mind, you know, thinking that you're a bad mom, um, you know, it can get quite severe and you can have thoughts about harming yourself. Um, or even your baby. Um, so there's a huge spectrum of symptoms and it can be from really mild that you think, oh, it's just nothing. It's just how I'm feeling. You know, it's just a continuation of those baby blues to something that can be really severe and severe depression and even into psychosis that needs, you know, critical and acute care mm -hmm. ASAP. So um, yeah, it can be a lot of different things and a lot of different symptoms individual for each mum as well. Mm -hmm. So generally it's when anxiety um, or depression begins sometimes in the year after birth um, and I guess is referred to as post postnatal anxiety and or depression. Um, yeah. And I, you just referred to um, the baby blues before. So I'd love to know the baby blues and postnatal depression, the same thing, or are they different? No, they're completely different. So, okay. How so? most mums experience, you know, the baby blues. So, you know, you give birth to this baby and you're a mess. You know, you're physically exhausted. Your body's just given birth to a child. You're, and you might have had complications. You might still be, you know, bleeding and having all that. You've got all these emotions going through you. You might be breastfeeding, having problems with that. Might be your first child. And it's very overwhelming. So those baby blues often set in the first few days after birth and you might find yourself crying, you're in hospital going, I don't know why I'm so upset and I'm so happy to have the baby, but I'm crying here, I don't know what I'm doing. And, you know, that can happen for, you know, you know, a couple of days after birth and up to a week, but it then fades away and so then you start to feel a little bit more normal um you know you could still be overwhelmed by having you know the new baby and you know you still got all the physical healing after birth but that emotional stuff settles down so if you have or are developing symptoms of postnatal depression and anxiety the way to distinguish that from the baby blues is that it's just continuing so it's not just you know the week or so after birth Okay. So once a mum does establish that, what should they do if they think they have perinatal depression or anxiety? Then? Well, obviously it is to talk to someone and, you know, for some of us, we might have a really good relationship with our GP or, you know, an early childhood health nurse if we're, you know, going through the care of our local health centre. Um, but if you can't, you know, talk to those people you don't feel comfortable quite yet you know um you know talking to a friend or jumping online because 
Panda, so the, um, the organisation you mentioned before, they actually have a helpline mm -hmm. that you can call, as do the Gidget Foundation. Yes. Um, and they have psychologists and everything that, you know, you can chat with and just check in with and going, you know, maybe there's something going on here, maybe not, and they could be reassuring or, you know, say, no, you're okay, you know, just keep monitoring it or go, no, you know, you might need to go and see your GP. And so that first step is to reach out for help and it can be really hard to reach out for help and so thanks to the beauty of having smartphones and the internet and social media <laughs> sometimes it could just be a search in google do i have postnatal depression and just that first step of just you know realizing that there might be something going on for you yes so as a question can it be treated and if so i mean how how was it treated Absolutely. It is a treatable and manageable condition. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the way it's treated is completely different depending on each individual um, and the severity of it. So a mild depression might be treated with, you know, just um, talk therapy through counsellors or mm -hmm. psychologists. Yep. Um, there are some group programs as well for mums with postnatal depression. Great. Um, some, some mothers might need medication and antidepressants. Um, and that would be decided on by a GP um, and then other mothers who might be much more severe who might be referred on to psychiatrists um, might need more intensive management and there are even some inpatient mum and baby units um, in psychiatric hospitals um, that may manage them as well so it really just depends upon the mum um, the level of um, her postnatal depression and yeah. how it's impacting her life hey Wonderful. Um, and, you know, you've mentioned with a lot of those um, therapy services and, and support services about the importance of talking about the experience and, and, and whatnot. So I'd love to know from your pers perspective, why is it so important to talk about our experiences for perinatal depression and anxiety? Well, the first thing is, of course, to normalise how we're feeling. So if we talk to someone who's supportive and, you know, helps women with um, postnatal depression and they can say to you, I can understand how you're feeling and say there are other mums who feel like that and that it's normal and it's okay for you to feel that, that just will in turn inside ourselves just make us go, okay. I can relax a little bit. Not alone. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm not alone. And when we normalize it and talk to professionals who are there to help us, it also gives us hope that there is that treatment, that this is not going to be how we're going to experience our entire motherhood career and our journey through being a mum with our child. So when that when all that happens, we then start to relax. And when we start to relax, we know that some of the symptoms of depression and anxiety don't completely disappear, but they reduce. And then once we're more relaxed and you know we're comfortable in that therapeutic relationship, we then feel you know more confident to take steps to look after ourselves and be on that journey towards recovery. There is a very different energy to being completely in our own head and in our own thoughts to then have the energy of actually speaking out what's going on in our head and in our thoughts too. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And it, I think it's just the process of actually moving some of that energy outside of, of your yeah. body, you know, actually. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. There's, there's countless benefits to be able to speak about it. Um, now in your article um, that we've published for you in, um, in that you share four steps um, that anyone can take to help overcome the feelings of shame, which you've um, touched on at the start of the, um, the chat as well. Um, and, you know, in general experience in postnatal depression um, for, for, for mums to seek the support that they need. Um, so I just wondered um, with that, if you could maybe just go through some of those steps with us and just share what they are now and, and how a mum should um, sort of best respond um, yeah, to those. <laughs> yeah. So again, yeah, that, that first thing is, of course, you know, don't isolate yourself, you know, reach out to anyone around you who can support you, connect with your GP, early childhood health nurses. That really is 
one of the first steps, but it's also one of the hardest as well. So it's easy to say, just reach out. But if you're in that really dark place, um, and I know that dark place well, um, it can be really hard. And so as mothers, you know, we're quite often taught to be self-sacrificial. Self you know, our child in front of ourselves, we do everything for our child and we put ourselves backwards. And I like to reframe seeking help for um, how we're feeling as a mum as a thing that we do for our child because, you know, we're quite happy to do lots of things for our child. And when we look after ourselves, we have more within ourselves to give to our child and to do the things that we need to do as a mum. So seeking help for how we're feeling isn't a selfish act. It is an act that not only looks after ourselves, but it helps us be the best mum that we can be, which helps our relationship with our child, which sets them up for the best, you know, growth and development that they can. So if mums are having that really hard thing, oh, no one should be worrying about me. I've got to worry about the child. If you want to worry about your child, worry about you too. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think really reframing that is a huge part of getting over that stigma and that it being a good thing to reach out um, for help. Okay, so the first one's to, um, well, just do not isolate and, and take that first step of moving forward and actually seeking help. Yep. Yeah, well, what's the second yeah, one? Absolutely. So, yeah, that was um, the reframing of, you know, how you are seeking help as a positive thing for your child mm -hmm. um, and for the relationship that you have with your child. There's a lot of evidence to say um, that children with mothers who have untreated mental health problems and who don't get the support that they need have, you know, worse outcomes than children who have mothers who have that support. Yes. So if, um, you know, if you're really having a hard time struggling, reaching out, then just do it for your child. If you don't, can't do it for yourself, it's not a selfish act at all. So the first one is don't isolate. The second one is reframe seeking help. The third one um, you've mentioned there is to use affirmations. Can you maybe just expand a little bit on this? Yeah, so um, affirmations are positive statements that we say about ourselves. And, mm -hmm. you know, my experiences with postnatal depression, I really internalised it and went into that, oh, I'm a bad mum thing. Um, you know, it's all my fault. Um, you know, I was carrying a lot of guilt from the separation with my ex. Um, and so you end up feeling really negative about yourself and then um, negative, you know, I was because my daughter was crying all the time thinking I'm a horrible mom. I can't even look after my child. And you end up just in this horrible negative cycle. And so really starting to challenge the way that you think is hard, but is can be a really good way to help support you um, to reach out. And my favorite affirmation that I still use to this day, even though I've definitely recovered from all my PND was that I love and accept myself exactly as I am. And so we can end up hating ourselves when we're feeling, you know, depressed and anxious and feeling like a bad mum. And just a little bit of self-love and self-care um, goes a lot way to, you know, motivating us to actually reach out for more help. Wonderful. And it does state um, the, the, this actually, the affirmations was a, a big part of, of your recovery process. Is, is that something that you did every day? Yes. So I used to um, do it every time I saw my reflection. Um, so whether it was in the um, bathroom mirror um, or in the mirror in the bedroom or while I was driving or even in the window or anything, I would just say it. And, you know, I felt really silly doing it at first. Um, and you don't tend to believe it at first, but the more you think it and, you know, the more you internalize it, it is one part of the puzzle towards feeling better. And when we start to feel better and we raise that little bit of self-belief, we then often have that courage to ask for help. Um, so it's just really wonderful to help, you know, lift you up. And yeah, I still use it on the bad days that I have and when I get that mummy guilt and just, you know, accept that I'm human, like yes, everybody. The very powerful affirmations. Um, we've actually done a, a, um, a whole podcast recently on I am statements and a big advocate yeah. for that. Um, so I think it's brilliant that you've used that. Yeah. Uh, and the last one you mentioned is seek treatment. Yes. So as well as reaching out, it's also participating in that treatment 
relationships. So that might be, you know, talk therapy with a counsellor, psychologist group program. Um, it might be medication if that's um, something that your doctors decide that that's appropriate for you. But the whole thing about participating in treatment is that it normalises it and you're connecting with people who are specialists with um, treating mums with PND. And so then you feel like it's not a bad thing that you have PND um, and that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Um, you know, any good therapist will not only help you feel and cope with how you're feeling now, but also help you look towards the future and towards your goals for your recovery. Um, so it, that also improves um, your mood and then you feel less shame, it's less intense and it helps all of it. Yeah. And following on from that, I mean, what other things can mums do, I guess, on a daily basis to help support their recovery um, and, you know, as they're sort of working through postnatal and perinatal depression and anxiety? Is there anything else that you can maybe suggest? And I think there's um, an article that we had actually linked to in, a, in our article that you've actually um, published previously about emotional management for better parenting um, and just generally recovering from perinatal depression. There's lots of wonderful things that you've, you've got in there um, and, and obviously understanding and, and defining, um, you know, um, what, what postnatal depression is um but you know for example things like awareness you've, you've got in there and fostering connections a lot of the wonderful things that you've already mentioned i just wanted to see is there anything else um you do mention about practicing gratitude um have you found that that sort of helped you throughout your your, your experiences at all Absolutely. Still to this day, I do my gratitude practice and I've, I've even taught my children and we sit around the um, dining table, you know, naming the three things that we're most grateful for each day. Oh, I love that. Um, yeah. <laughs> gratitude just, um, you know, there's a lot of evidence to say that it improves the quality of our lives um, and helps with our emotional and mental well-being. Yeah. And it just, like you said, it just gets us out of our head and it can be the simplest of things, you know, I'm grateful for the fact that I got out of bed and got dressed today or I got to have a shower or eat a nice meal. And it just helps us look towards the positive things in our life. And when we're consumed in a depressed state or an, um, and an anxious state, it can be really hard to find the positives. So even if you could only think of one grateful thing each day, each day, if you add another one and another one, you'll start they have to, to be different things. Positive. Yes. Yeah. They all build. And yeah, it does build and it's then that snowball effect and yeah. then you start to see more of the good within yourself, within your child, within your life um, and then that improves your mental and emotional well-being. And positivity breeds po positivity, which I love. Yeah. Now, um, I just wanted to touch on another subject which you mentioned at the, f at the start of our chat today, that there's another form of mental illness that can affect women after birth and that being postnatal uh, psychosis, which is, um, I guess, which is, is I guess, the, the next stage and or a, a much more serious um, version of postnatal depression. And I understand that it affects one to two women in every 1,000 after childbirth. Um, but I just wanted to see if you just could maybe explain a little bit of the difference between that and, and postnatal depression. Yeah, so postnatal depression, I guess you could say, oh, how do you say, is a bit more less intense and psychosis is um, quite a severe mental health condition that needs management really quickly um, and so mums might lose a bit more connection with reality um, there can be things like hallucinations um, hearing wow. voices you know really getting into severe psychiatric symptoms you know they might um, fear that their baby is talking to them or you know uh, voices that telling them to hurt their baby or hurt themselves and it's quite a dissociation from um, from themselves from life um, and it is an emergency that really does need to be treated ASAP so they're the mums and you know if there are um, mums listening to this who see those symptoms in you know their friends or something like this and get concerned you know you need to stay with your friend and um, you know maybe take them up to the doctor or take them to the emergency room and these mothers really need intense support but there is that support out for them 
there as well. As well. So um, just to clarify, postnatal psychosis is a, an extremely serious mental health condition that can be potentially life threatening life threatening um and they can put both the mother and the baby at risk and of course if anyone watching and listening if you suspect you or your partner or a friend or family or anyone you know is experiencing um this illness potentially please seek help immediately um but all in all it's been um, a really wonderful chat today heather i'd love um for you just maybe just to summarize i guess your key messages for anyone watching and listening today well, the key is, I guess, to be open and honest with the people around you um, who love and support you mm -hmm. um, with how you're feeling um, and reach out as soon as you can, um, as soon as you feel comfortable. And if you don't, then jump online and search because there are hundreds of thousands of different websites and even on Instagram, you know, positive, um, you know, accounts that normalize how you're feeling. And so you're not alone. Um, like you said, the statistics are PND is very common um, in women and in fathers. Um, and it can be in adoptive parents as well. So it's not just mothers who give birth to um, their children, but adoptive parents can um, experience as, as well. So it is just about connecting and reaching out as soon as you can and as soon as you feel comfortable. Wonderful. And if um, parents have got any other questions um, that would like to reach out to you and also to connect through Blissed Out Mums, um, if yeah. you could just maybe just give us a, a quick overview on what Blissed Out Mums is um, and how we can reach you and find you, that would be wonderful. Awesome. Yeah. So um, when I did go through that horrible postnatal depression with my second child and I um, was seeing a psychologist and all of that stuff. I am a very proactive person. And I'm a very impatient person and I like to fix things really quickly. And so I actually turned to some coaching strategies in combination with my talk therapy to help get me out of um, you know, that horrible dark place. And that was starting to use things like the gratitude and the affirmations and a lot of focus on self-care and stuff. And as I dragged myself out of my PND to the point that um, eight weeks or so after seeing one of my friends, we were at a thermomix demonstration and she hardly recognized me because I'd gotten myself out of that dark place. And I was like, well, if I can get myself out of this dark place with, you know, really practical strategies, then I know that I can share them with mums as well. So, and it's always nice as a mum who's been there to be able to relate to mums who are in that situation. Because again, that normalizes it and takes all the guilt out of it. So, yeah, so that was uh, six years ago that I started Blissed Out Mums. Um, and so have been providing online and in person um, and Skype Zoom coaching to mums struggling with PND and how they're feeling as a mum. And so you can access my um, all my details through Facebook and Instagram by searching Blissed Out Mums. Um, and I've got a website, which is www.blissedoutmums.com.au <laughs> and all my contact details are there. So um, you can send me an email. We can get on um, line and have a chat. I'm always available um, and there's never any guilt. Um, it's a no judgment zone um, here and you will always be met with, you know, open arms and um, as much support as you need. And if needed, um, I've got a whole list of practitioners that I refer um, mums on to. Heather, thank you so much today for your time, sharing your experiences, um, all your wisdom and knowledge. Um, really, really grateful for this. And we'll have all of those links in the show notes. Um, take care and um, hopefully we'll have thank another you. opportunity in the not too distant future to have another chat. But until then, take That's care and stay wonderful. safe. Yes, absolutely. You too and everybody listening. Thanks, Heather. Take care. Okay, bye. Thanks, Rachel. Bye.